complaint. It was nice to get a break, but uh, but we are definitely ready to uh, ramp it back up and get into the routine of two games on one coach's show every week again. Let me ask you this about that, there, because I was thinking about that. I've, I've thought about this for the last 10 years or so. College basketball used to not be structured this way with all the breaks. Do you think fundamentally it's good or bad? Uh, I liked it, frankly, when they started after Thanksgiving where there were these Christmas tournaments and all that. But now it just seems like, oh, you got a week off for exams. Now you got a week off for Christmas and New Year's. And it's just, and everything's kind of crammed into early November before people start to care. I, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts about that? That's tough. It really is. I mean, football is so dominant. I just saw something a little bit ago on social media showing the top 100 U.S. TV broadcasts of the year, and they were all football. Other than the Thanksgiving Day Parade, the Oscars, and some poli- one one item that was political programming, I don't know what it was, maybe a debate, everything else was football. Most of that NFL, some of that college, but for basketball, it is just such an uphill climb to find their, their uh, I guess, their balance point in the early portion of the season, so long as football is going on, and you could argue that starting as early as they do, they get lost. But then you could also say, you know, sometimes it's harder during the holidays because ESPN, you know, is focused on all the bowl games that they've done so well with in terms of viewership. So I don't know that there is a a great answer in there in terms of the best time to do it. Uh, But certainly you're right. It it does feel like there's a lot more dead time uh, over the holidays than, than there once was. And, uh, I don't know that that's going to change anytime soon because TV makes so many of the decisions for everyone in this industry. You know, Derek, uh, while we were down there for for celebrating that and JC, uh, we didn't get a chance to spend a ton of time with JC. Obviously, he had some things to do the the day before and all that type (laughs) of stuff. But uh, but Bill Gunner and Whittle and myself and Phil, a a lot of the conversation we had was about this basketball team Uh, and and. The fact that they – they I mean, the loss to Clemson, it always stings when you lose to that team in the upstate. Certainly could have helped them by winning with the season the Tigers are having. But it really, it really didn't hurt them. And, and, and they've, done, they've done nothing to hurt themselves. I mean, they, they historically, as you know, you've had a front row seat for all of it. There's one or two, maybe sometimes more hiccups, and you're going, what do we need to do to eliminate this? But, but even though they were close from time to time, they found ways to win. So what – what have you learned about this team through the non-conference league? Well, they are really steady, uh, and the maturity shows through in just what you're talking about. I mean, there are plenty of really good college basketball teams out there who have stumbled this year somewhere along the way. I mean, somebody as good as Florida Atlantic, who was in the Final Four last year, they they beat Arizona in maybe the best game I've watched all season this year, and then they turn around and lose to Florida Gulf Coast, who needed overtime to beat a Division II team just before that. It is – it happens. It, it really does. And it's it's very nice for it not to be on South Carolina's resume this year. Any sort of loss that needs to be forgotten or uh, justified or explained, there's nothing like that. And to get into conference play at 12 and 1, I'm with you. I, I think that's probably as good as you could possibly have envisioned. You, you had the late lead at Clemson. It stinked to let it get away. Uh, but I mean, come on! They're uh, they're the you know maybe the best team in the ACC. You are on the road; it happens. Uh, they're that that's a loss that no one's going to question. Uh, so yeah, uh, it, it was it was about as good as you could hope for. And now you have to find out what it takes to do on the next level, and that's what I'm curious about because all the things this team has done so very well in terms of uh, taking care of the basketball, sharing the basketball, defending it up more consistent level than I anticipated. That is all well and good, but it gets so much harder to do that in conference play. And we were talking with Coach Paris and uh, assistant coach Tim Buckley on the, sh- the radio show last night about that. You get in the league play and everybody knows what everybody else does. Scouting reports are so thorough. Nothing's going to catch anyone by surprise. And it's just, it's so much harder to, to, to inch forward on every possession. Uh, and and so that's where it all changes starting tomorrow, and we will see uh, how this team reacts to being put in a more challenging situation in, in conference play. Gamecocks, uh, according to the release from the university just a few minutes ago, are seeking to begin 13-1 and one for just the sixth time in program history. The last time they did do it, they were left out of the tournament the year before y'all went to the 
Final Four, uh, Derek. So it's only happened twice since the turn of the century, 03, 04 under Dave Odom. The others, 1970 and prior. Um, you, there's a lot to – and there's a lot that goes into a lot of what you just said too, confidence, maturity. Hats off, by the way, to the – finally, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but finally we get a one of those heart-throbbing feel-good videos yesterday about Gamecock basketball. Um, they spent a lot of time on that. You could tell they did. It was really good, and the end of it was really good too when Miles Studi was asked the question by our friend David Cloninger. How you, how paraphrasing here? How are you going to handle this, that, and the other? And he said, "Well, how are they going to handle us?" That tells me a lot about these guys. As you mentioned, they've been around a while. They're very confident in what they can do, and they're very mature as well. Yeah, they are, and they've been. You know, guys like Studi's been in this league before. He's he's played against this competition the last couple of years, and certainly Michi, I think, probably learned a lot about what it takes last year and. Maybe some of the other guys haven't been in this conference, but they're old enough to have played conference ball and know how much it changes when you get into your league, no matter where you are, whether that's, you know, transitioning into SOCOM play. If, if you're B.J. Mack when you were at Wofford or, you know, whatever Talon Cooper went through when, when, uh, when you know, Minnesota began Big Ten play last year. So they realize what it's going to be about. The freshmen probably don't, but there's only a couple of them on this roster and they don't have as much of a role to play in the, in all of it. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how they react. I'm glad they're opening at home. I wish, I wish it was when students were back on campus. I don't know quite what to expect from the student section tomorrow. I hope there's some kids who are back early and ready to roll, um, because that will make a difference, especially when your next two after this one are uh, both on the road, you know, you, you have to try and take business, take care of your business at home. In, uh, in in conference play in any sport and, you know, fully leverage what that home court or home field advantage can provide you. I, I, I'm going to say this 15 more times before we let you get off the air. I literally can't wait till 1130 tomorrow to cut on the broadcast uh, for you and Casey. I know that place is going to be jumping. It's going to be raucous. I'm going to ask you about Mississippi State and w what you expect out of those guys, but I'm going to preface it with something we've discussed a couple of times this week about the January slate for the Gamecocks. It is difficult or difficult road contest, but everybody in the league has difficult schedules now because it is so good. It might be the best league in college basketball, Derek. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you what they, what you expect from them, but I'm saying this after this one, <laughs> they have the Vols at home, fifth ranked Tennessee, then they've got Alabama walking in. Anybody that looks at Alabama's record and is judging them off that eight and five, you are sadly mistaken. And then they've got to go to Rupp. So those next three are as difficult as any three you could string together in this league, as we all well know. This is they're probably viewing this as we have got to go to Columbia and win this ball game, or we could be in big time danger here. What type of basketball do they play, and how are they going to try to achieve that? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the one thing I would push back onto what you said there is they had such a disastrous start last year and still managed to turn around. I think they may have been one and seven last year coming out of uh, out of break out of the gating conference play, and they and they kept their composure, turned it around, got hot late, made the NCAA tournament, sure. uh, and they have all five starters back from that team, so they they know not to press the panic button. I think. But you're right. That's a daunting way to start uh, in, in league play for sure. When you talk about you know that those uh, those three games that you know follow this one and starting on the road, um, they are very similar to last year. The only thing we don't know yet is how big of a factor Tolu Smith can be because he has he was he's their best and he has missed the entirety of the non conference prior to their last game. His first minutes of the season came against Bethune Cookman on New Year's Eve. But he has been cleared of any minutes limitations. Now, he is a old school, traditional, low post big man. And he can be a huge factor both ends of the court as a rim protector defensively and offensively. Uh, he, he can really make for a long day with his abilities around the basket. And, you know, I think Lamont said it last night, you've got to have a lot of fouls to use. Uh, and he feels good that he does between BJ and uh, Benjamin and Josh. You got three guys uh, who can spend some time trying to defend in the low post. And and they'll all have to against uh, a guy as talented as, as Tolu Smith. But really, defense is the calling card 
for this Mississippi State team. Last year, they were so good on defense and so bad on offense. They were dead last in the nation in three-point shooting uh, and not much better than dead last in the nation in free throw shooting. And they went out and addressed that, you know, with the transfer portal and with uh, high school recruiting to try and get the shooting better. And it's a, it's shown some improvement, but it's still a team that hangs its hat on the defensive end. They challenge every shot. When you were going to watch tomorrow, if you're there, uh, you know, or if you're, you know, doing the TV thing, but every three-point attempt, there will be someone flying at the shooter. And they don't care if you pump fake and move somewhere else. They would prefer that. They, they want to try and impact and challenge every single shot from the perimeter. And it, and it pays off. I mean, there's no denying that when you look at their, you know, any of the analytic numbers for this bunch, you start with defense. They are fifth in the nation in three point percentage defense. Folks only make about 26 percent of their threes against them. And that's because of their aggressiveness, how they challenge it. And then their guards are constantly looking to challenge passing lanes and pick your pocket. They, they have a bunch of dudes who, who crop up, you know, rack up steel totals. It's, you know, it's kind of the opposite of South Carolina's approach defensively where the steel totals are low because they're just trying to play sound half court defense and not take any risks, stay in position. These guys come at you so aggressively and, and, just even that first pass when you're, you know, when you're kind of activating the offense, just trying to get it to the wing to begin your offense, they're going to challenge that. I, I think John Rothstein from CBS Sports uh, basically said it was like having root canal without Novocaine. That's that's what it's like playing against the Mississippi State defense. And uh, there's a little bit of hyperbole there, but I, I get it, man. They are they are a real bear to deal with at that end of the court. So who becomes, I don't want to say more valuable, they're all valuable, but in your mind, as it stands today, who who is going to be the key to the Gamecock success if they can have some offensively tomorrow? Is it Talon Cooper? Uh, well, a lot of it will be on Talon because taking care of the basketball and keeping those turnovers low is is huge. And like I said, Mississippi State's guards are going to try and get into – uh, the ball handle, whoever that is, and with Talon being bigger, they will try and get up and under his knees a lot. You can just expect that from from uh, from their backcourt, no question about it. Uh, so yeah, he'll he'll have a big role to play, and plus he he is the head of the snake as far as I think trying to make sure everybody stays calm and stays in there within themselves and doesn't panic uh, any if it is harder for them out of the gate. Um, South Carolina. The second time around with Mississippi State in Starkville last year, looked to have learned a lot from the first time and played them very well uh, down there. And that was at the time of year when State was really playing some of its best basketball toward the end of the season. So I think Michi will retain that a lot. Josh Gray was a big factor in that last year. I'm real curious to see what his role looks like tomorrow, considering he has been uh, a bit of a non-factor, really, throughout the month of December. Great point. Derek Scott, voice of Gamecock basketball. Yeah, on that, I mean, Lamont, was it last – or not last week, I don't know, the last couple of weeks, he, he mentioned that publicly. He's like, look, Josh, especially in SEC play, he, he's he got a spot here. Like, he can be – he's got a role. Uh, it's really more along of him figuring out that he has that role and, and do it to the best of his ability. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Uh, I, what, what in your mind is that role for Josh Gray? Well, I think matchups matter for him as a seven footer. The game has gone away from, uh, you know, that sort of player having a consistent ability to impact the game unless they are just dominant along the lines of, you know, Zach Eady or, or somebody like that. So he needs to see folks on the other side of the court who look like he does. And, and that hasn't happened much in non conference play, certainly not of late. Uh, it's been tough matchups for him against smaller, you know, post players who can stretch the floor and pull him away from the basket. He won't have to worry about that tomorrow. Uh, Tolu Smith and William Bell are a couple of very large humans, uh, and they are going to focus on the low post being in the paint, which is what he does. Uh, and so based on horses for courses, I think Josh could uh, could definitely be asked to, to, to play a larger role tomorrow. I hope so. I would love to see him going just based on what you've said in years past. He's a great kid, and this could be a big confidence builder for him if he can go out there and get it done. Uh, a couple months ago, we were talking about you know the early stages of this team and what to expect, and 
uh, Colin Murray Boyles came up, and this is, I think, when we first got news that he had come down with mono. And I remember JC saying, uh, oh, yeah, this kid's good. You know, and JC, the big, big time basketball guy, he, he, he'll tell you real quick. <laughs> Six, sixth grade, he could fire it up from out there deep. Um, eighth, all conference. Eighth, yeah. eighth grade. I'm That's sorry. Great. You know, gold jacket, green jacket. But, say. um, not just a yeah. church league assassin. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that would have been tenth grade, twenty three point seven points per game. Yeah, <laughs> no, I was a ball. you guys don't believe me at all. I wish. I no, I do believe. No, no, I'm, I'm just, I, I've, I've had confirmation from this from independent sources. You, I, I, you were the most athletic self, out of the prime group. Yeah, don't cell phone, sources. cell phone. It, yeah, that, those are the times I wish we had cell phone cameras. Because <laughs> uh, my, my athletic greatness would be known, but I also maybe in prison. So uh, it, isn't isn't that crazy? Both of us are so thankful that they didn't exist when we were teenagers. And and JC just pointed out a reason we all might wish they they yeah, didn't. Exist it's a little bit, bit yeah. you know. But uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, 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 I digress. Colin Mori Bulls, good. Well, okay, that's where we left <laughs> off. <laughs> and I think he, Derek, how close is he to kind of being what they? I mean, clearly, he's young. I mean, he's got a long time to continue to grow up and get better and better and better. But uh, he's gained minutes and he's gained strength and he's gained knowledge playing at this level. What, what have you watched him do since he's been back for a month? And and uh, what do you think he will do as SEC play begins and the competition starts to get pretty darn good? Well, his most two or two most productive games were his last two. I think that says something about – how much uh, more comfortable he's getting and getting his strength back. And he went up for a dunk against uh, Florida a and was It was a play where they fed Bozeman's Verdonk in the high post right around the free throw line, then spun around to face the basket. Defense came towards him, and he slapped a bounce pass down under the hoop to uh, Colin. And he was right at the rim, but he went up in, in a much more explosive fashion than we had seen, and he dunked on a guy who was right there with him. And that was, I think, telling that he feels more confidence in his ability to go up. And, and Lamont and I talked about that afterwards, the, the the comparison between his first outing at Clemson, where he got a, another feed, where he was going to the rim, and he went up soft, so to speak. He was going to lay it in, and the ball got swatted off the backboard by P.J. Hall or somebody. And it was like, okay, and Lamont said, he goes, you know, if that is Colin during this summer when we're in the Bahamas or getting ready for that, he goes, he, he goes up and yanks that dunk and it's not even up for debate, but he just, he doesn't have that kind of energy and strength right now. Well, he showed that maybe that's back somewhat the way he went up against uh, Florida A&M. Now, of course, for most any true freshman, the transition to league play is usually like a cold bucket of water in the face uh, because you have to see how much more physical the games get and how much harder it is to you know make anything happen. Uh, so there, there, there's that that he's got awaiting him you know this week. But I definitely feel like he's ready to uh, to contribute more, and I'm really uh, excited to see how he does match up because Mississippi State, uh, besides Tolu Smith in the middle, they've got some really experienced forwards, guys that have been around the block two and three years. Uh, Cameron Matthews, DJ Jeffries, old guys. Similar body types, though, to Colin. And uh, and so that will be, you know, those will both be good matchups for him uh, to uh, to see how he can can handle things his first time out. You know, you know, Derek, that stretch there after the Clemson game, go up and, and survive in Greenville uh, and, and take down the Pirates. Um, CSU, CSU played really well. Give them some credit. I mean, they, they played really, really well. Um, Gamecocks survive by four. Uh, Winthrop, you know, gave him a little bit of a run. When, I, I like Winthrop. Uh, Gamecocks get out of there with a 10-point win. And then th- these last two, 27-point victory over Elon, 32-point victory over Florida A&M, which I looked at Florida A&M's non-con schedule. And, oof, boy, they play everybody. Man. Yeah. Um, what do you think that – let's see, 32 um, – it was 60 points, I guess, 59 points combined – uh, victories in those last two games. Did that do anything for this team? It, it, it kind of felt like they needed that getting into the break and going into conference play. Yeah, uh, maybe just to assure people that it wasn't, you know, uh, um, fool's gold, so to speak, uh, with the, the production and the wins over 
Virginia Tech and Grand Canyon and, and playing as well, you know, as competitively as they did against Clemson. It, it might have been needed to maybe reassure people of that. I don't know that the players necessarily worried about it as much as maybe some of us, you know, watching externally might have, but it could not have been a bad thing. And Lamont talked about how going into that last game, he wanted to make sure his guys didn't coast and didn't really squander uh, or spoil any of what they had achieved by having one of those, those sorts of bad days. And yeah, there certainly, there are a couple games there you could pull out and say, well, they didn't dominate the way they should have. But again, man, these are still, this is an older team, but this is still young. These are still young people. Uh, and they are going to be completely guilty consistently of looking at uh, things just like the rest of us do and saying, ah, it's just Florida a &M. It's just Elon. They, you know, they, if, if they don't know you, how, how can we expect them to really come out dialed in? Uh, and, and that's just the reality I'd say of any sport, but you know, you shouldn't have to worry about that from here on in. Uh, and, and the important thing is, like we said earlier, they didn't stumble. They might, have, they might have, you know, gotten a little bit off balance, but they never truly hit the deck and it didn't cost them any. Um, and, yeah, yes. Mississippi State lost to Southern University. Yeah, right, year, so. exactly. Yeah. Mississippi State lost to Georgia Tech. And what is it they like to say about not letting uh, one one game cost you yep. two? I don't, don't think there's you. any doubt that, that that Georgia Tech loss cost them the next time out against Southern. Uh, and, and that's one I'm sure that they are hopeful it won't come back to bite them like it potentially could. If it's like last year, you know, last year they were in the first four. They barely got into the tournament. They were last year where South Carolina is this year, either undefeated or one loss and a surprising performance in the non-conference. Uh, then league play hit them like a, you know, a, a brick wall and it took them a while to get, get them, their balance back. And then they've really finished strong and just got in. But had they had one of those bad losses last year in the non-conference, they probably don't get one of those last four spots. Yeah, I, I remember that. When they uh, the the like you said earlier, state really got it turned around, and then I think they finished the regular season like nine and three or nine and four or something like that. But those last few games after they beat Carolina, that game you were talking about in Stark uh, in Starkville, yep, they turned around and got beat by Vanderbilt. You remember that? And then in Vanderbilt, yeah, they lost to Vanderbilt in, if I'm not mistaken, the regular season finale. Yeah, the last game yeah. of the regular season, they lost at Vandy. Then they went to the conference tournament and and felt like we've got to have success here. And I remember watching them in overtime beat Florida the first game of the day, and uh, and and that was enough because they turned around and lost to Alabama. Ever expected them to the next right. day? Got blown out, and I'm sure they they didn't walk out of you know the arena feeling like well we know our oh, we're in good shape here, but they did manage to get in. Played Pittsburgh, lost by one. But when they when they got Tolu Smith to come back for his 27th season of college basketball, when he announced he was coming back, and they had the whole roster basically, the whole starting lineup back, it was kind of like, wow, this this could be a huge opportunity uh, for Chris Chans to, to to really take some steps. Uh, Derek, I want to I want to ask you about the SEC in the in a minute, but uh, but I we haven't mentioned Michi much. Uh, just four of 22 from long range. Uh, since the East Carolina game prior to that, he hits memory at hit six in that, that Clemson game up there. Um, so he, he certainly struggled from behind the arc. We all know what he's capable of, but what's really, really, really been neat about him. Oh, God, I don't even know if I want to say it. Going back to the <laughs> note, you know where I'm going on the free throw side of this thing, right? The, the numbers are, let's just, I'm not going to say it all because I don't want to jinx him, but going back to the Notre Dame game. I don't know if there's anybody out there better than him in college basketball. He, he's he's been, perfect since then. I don't mind saying it because I don't okay, buy that right. garbage. And I, I okay, said right. here in every game well, since then, guy. Casey would that. put his hands in his – or his head in his hands every time I would mention it. But I, I was convinced that Michi didn't hear me say it, so I couldn't really impact things. Now, he, he's really steadied the ship at the line. And you're talking about the three-point shooting. I, I, I have to imagine there's so much emphasis defensively on teams to run him off of the line that it's opened the door for him to drive, penetrate, get fouled, uh, and also hand out assists. And he and you've seen those numbers going in the right direction. He's really created opportunities for his teammates uh, with his ability to get to the 10. And uh, so, yeah, uh, he's, you, like we talked earlier, 
you won't get a clean look at a three against these guys tomorrow. That's guaranteed. You've got to just keep your focus and finish the shot. Or if you're not going to do that, you've got to really try and go aggressively into the paint and, and see what you can create that way. So uh, Gamecocks need Michi to be, you know, uh, their leader. I mean, that's just the bottom line. He's the most consistent offensive threat they've got. Uh, and that's been the case basically since conference play started last year. And they need that in in uh, in a big way from him from him uh, really throughout the next couple of months. I'm going to predict Carolina scores 140 tomorrow uh, with all these defensive <laughs> talk that we're we're discussing. That'd be fun for you and Casey, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> So, uh, th this th this is elite, Derek. It's probably been a while, maybe ever. I don't know. You have to do a lot of research on that. But but the slate tomorrow to open SEC play is just absolutely phenomenal. And I know that you keep up with all these programs because you're going to see them all uh, throughout the year. And you're a basketball geek like a lot of us are. Um, for those that haven't seen the schedule, look it up. If you like basketball, settle in at noon and you'll be done tomorrow night around 1030 and then Alyssa Lang and the crew on the SEC Network will carry you to about midnight. Um, Kentucky on the road at Florida tomorrow. Auburn on the road at Arkansas. Ole Miss at Tennessee. LSU's at A&M. You know, Alabama's got Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt has struggled. But anytime you go on the road, especially in Nashville, you know, weird things happen sometimes. So it, it is really just a phenomenal slate. And I, and I wanted to roll that out there so you can give us your thoughts on the conference as they do step into yeah. SEC play. Uh, it's it's really deep. Big 12 is probably the only conference right now that can that can claim to be deeper, uh, and they don't have as many teams. But I mean, Big 12 is positioned right now where I think there are eight different you know teams. Who, I mean, everybody practically is in the top 60 of the net in that league. It's crazy. But no one else beyond them has more teams, top 50 net uh, rankings than the SEC, the, the ACC continues to really flounder these last couple of years. And, and uh, you know, yeah. their, their reputation as the basketball gods is really on, on life support. Uh, the way that league has, has kind of turned in the last couple of years after a couple of luminaries have, have retired uh, in, in their respective communities. But you, you look at what the SEC has right now, you've got the schools you thought would be good who have been like Tennessee uh, and, 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 you know, A&M, uh, but there's Ole Miss who I don't think anybody saw this coming, uh, long-term, I think everybody, you know, knows what Chris Beard can do, but my goodness, they're undefeated. Uh, and one of what three undefeated teams left in college basketball, yeah. uh, and then South Carolina certainly has been a surprise for a lot of people so far, Kentucky kind of bouncing back a little bit from the last couple of years. And they've gone back to the old formula of having a ton of talented freshmen. Uh, but these guys really have been able to uh, return that, that style of explosive offensive play that uh, Calipari, you know, made kind of famous down there in, in his first few years with all the great recruiting classes he had. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is a deep, deep league. Auburn has kind of stayed under the radar, but that's a top 25 program that Bruce has right now and more depth than he's had in a while. If there's anybody who may have been a little bit of a disappointment, big picture, it may be Arkansas. But when you, then you step back and look at who their losses are to, and you go, okay, there's absolutely nothing in there that really makes you raise a red flag. Just they haven't won as much as you might have thought they would. But Musselman has done a, a pretty amazing job year over year of getting his guys steadied when they've had some stumbles through injuries and so forth. And then you talked about Alabama earlier. Uh, yeah, I don't know why Nate Oates played the, the schedule he played, uh, but he, he put his guys through it and they'll be fine. I mean, I think they're still, yeah. you know, you look at, if you believe the analytics tell the real story about a team, I think uh, Ken Palm still has them top five in spite of all the losses. So the way they play still measures up. So yeah, there is a, there's a lot of talent uh, in this league right now. It's, it's pretty amazing. I admitted the Georgia Bulldogs as well off to a hot start. They've won a bunch of games since they got off a little slow this year. Got some good teams, by the way. Um, Dogs broke that 12 game losing streak last year to South Carolina. Gamecocks turned around and gave it back to them looking to start another 12 game streak. That's down the road tomorrow at noon, 1130. This guy, Derek Scott and Casey Manning, will uh, be on the call. The mics will be hot, and they will tip at noon on CBS. If you're going to the game, enjoy it. Hopefully that place will be rocking. I anticipate that it will. And uh, Carolina will start the entire slate of SEC play tomorrow. 
before anybody else gets on the floor. All those other teams, they don't get to listen to Derek. They can, but you're not the voice of them. Uh, you're the voice of us, and that's why we're the luckiest program in this conference and beyond. Really glad to have you. Good to see you. Can't wait to hear you tomorrow, and uh, and I hope they give you something to crow about after two hours of basketball. Hey, um, before I go, guys, uh, I just realized I got the itinerary for our road trip. I'm going to be in Tuscaloosa Monday night when they're playing the national championship football game. Uh, I wonder if I'll find anybody to uh, have a, a cold beverage and a peanut with uh, at any of the local establishments there on University Boulevard. We can talk about the challenges of the shotgun snap and uh, why that seems to be something that Coach Saban may have to focus on a little more next year. <laughs> I don't look there. You know, is is that why they all they're, they're doing search in portal? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that kid's yeah, he's long gone. Uh he's gonna go play football in Alaska. That's the only way he'll I hope he doesn't have any uh oak trees in his parents' front yard. Those will be gone. Jeez. I mean, oh, what man. a what a yeah, man. I that was wh- how about that? You're a football guy. How about this championship? Um oh, I'm Amazingly intrigued by considering the SEC is yeah. not involved. Uh, it has been the strangest year to see the balance out there. I mean, this is like the the old days when we were young, and you actually could have teams from all parts of the country who might be capable of winning the national championship. It has been so focused on our part of the country for so long now. Not that I'm complaining about that, but it is amazing to sit here and look up and and go, huh. Uh, Pac Pac twelve team in the uh, in the national championship, and no one's sitting here thinking they're going to get their doors blown off. It it is it's really uh, intriguing. I, I don't know when the when we look back at it all, will we all say, well, this had a lot to do with you know players with extra years of eligibility and more older guys. I don't know what it'll be attributable to, or if it will maybe be sustainable. But at least for this year, it's it's been it's been a ton of fun to uh, to watch how this season has unfolded, just from a you know a fan of college football perspective and uh, and guys that aren't necessarily NFL future stars, but still, you know, can come in and, and make a big difference uh, and lead a team like, uh, like, you know, like, like the kid, the, the Penix kid has done at Washington. It's, it's uh, been pretty amazing to watch. It really has. Yeah. It's a, you can make the argument. I don't know if Washington is the best offense in football. They're, they're up they're the best passing offense in football. There is no argument for who the best defense in college football is, at least from a point standpoint. It is Michigan. They only give up nine and a half per game. So that something's something got to give somewhere. Yeah. Uh, this will be know, the we'll see. northernmost uh, national champion since 97 when Michigan won a CODA title. Washington won a co title in 91. So 27 and 33 years. How about that? Just talking about that far north. Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, Seattle's far north, but it's a lot different climate than. In Michigan, it's not as cold, but uh, it doesn't uh, really sunshine up there. But yeah, uh, good for these guys. Um, and uh, I'm with you. I, I think that's that's good for the game. It's a shame that next year these are going to be two Big Ten schools, and we're going to go to all these national conferences and stuff. But uh, a heck of a finish, and the 14 playoff ended like it started because it started with a Big Ten Pac-12 game in Texas. And it's going to end with a Big Ten Pac-12 game in Texas. Yeah. I'm just happy those. Jerks of the Rose Bowl did not get their precious matchup because they ruined college football for a hundred years before they let us have a true champion. Derek, uh, can't wait to hear you tomorrow. Back to back road trips afterwards, as you mentioned, you're headed to T Town and then on the road to another Columbia, Missouri, before returning to face those Georgia Bulldogs that we just mentioned a little bit ago. But um, hopefully, the trip to Tuscaloosa will be a one and zero trip uh, for Gamecock basketball. Can't wait, man. Have a, have a-